Book 2, Chapter 2, Part 1 of 3 of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book 2, Chapter 2, Symposium. Part 1 of 3. Gloria had lulled Anthony's mind to sleep. She, who seemed of all women the wisest and the finest, hung like a brilliant curtain across his doorways, shutting out the light of the sun. In those first years what he believed bore invariably the stamp of Gloria. He saw the sun always through the pattern of the curtain. It was a sort of lassitude that brought them back to Marietta for another summer. Through a golden, enervating spring they had loitered, restive and lazily extravagant, along the California coast, joining other parties intermittently, and drifting from Pasadena to Coronado, from Coronado to Santa Barbara, with no purpose more apparent than Gloria's desire to dance by different music or catch some infinitesimal variant among the changing colors of the sea. Out of the Pacific there rose to greet them savage rocklands and equally barbaric hostelries built that, at tea-time, one might drowse into a languid wicker bazaar glorified by the polo costumes of Southampton and Lake Forest and Newport and Palm Beach. And, as the waves met and splashed and glittered in the most placid of the bays, so they joined this group and that, and with them shifted stations, murmuring ever of those strange, unsubstantial gaieties in wait, just over the next green and fruitful valley. A simple, healthy leisure class it was, the best of the men not unpleasantly undergraduate, they seemed to be on a perpetual candidate's list for some etherealized porcelain or skull and bones extended out indefinitely into the world. The women, of more than average beauty, fragilely athletic, somewhat idiotic as hostesses, but charming and infinitely decorative as guests. Sedately and gracefully they danced the steps of their selection in the balmy tea hours, accomplishing with a certain dignity the movement so horribly burlesqued by clerk and chorus girl the country over. It seemed ironic that in this lone and discredited offspring of the arts, Americans should excel unquestionably. Having danced and splashed through a lavish spring, Anthony and Gloria found that they had spent too much money, and for this must go into retirement for a certain period. There was Anthony's work, they said. Almost before they knew it, they were back in the gray house, more aware now that other lovers had slept there, other names had been called over the banisters. Other couples had sat upon the porch steps, watching the grey-green fields and the black bulk of woods beyond. It was the same Anthony, more restless, inclined to quicken only under the stimulus of several highballs, faintly, almost imperceptibly apathetic toward Gloria. But Gloria, she would be twenty-four in August, and was in an attractive but sincere panic about it. Six years to thirty! Had she been less in love with Anthony, her sense of the flight of time would have expressed itself in a reawakened interest in other men, in a deliberate intention of extracting a transient gleam of romance from every potential lover who glanced at her with lowered brows over a shining dinner table. She said to Anthony one day, How I feel is that if I wanted anything, I'd take it. That's what I've always thought all my life, but it happens that I want you, and so I just haven't room for any other desires. They were bound eastward through a parched and lifeless Indiana, and she had looked up from one of her beloved moving picture magazines to find a casual conversation suddenly turned grave. Anthony frowned out the car window. As the track crossed a country road, a farmer appeared momentarily in his wagon. He was chewing on a straw, and was apparently the same farmer they had passed a dozen times before, sitting in silent and malignant symbolism. As Anthony turned to Gloria, his frown intensified. You worry me, he objected. I can imagine wanting another woman under certain transitory circumstances, but I can't imagine taking her. But I don't feel that way, Anthony. I can't be bothered resisting things I want. My way is not to want them, to want nobody but you. Yet when I think that if you just happen to take a fancy to someone— Oh, don't be an idiot, she exclaimed. There'd be nothing casual about it, and I can't even imagine the possibility. This emphatically closed the conversation. Anthony's unfailing appreciation made her happier in his company than in any one's else. She definitely enjoyed him. She loved him. 
so the summer began very much as had the one before. There was, however, one radical change in Menage. The icy-hearted Scandinavian, whose austere cooking and sardonic manner of waiting on table had so depressed Gloria, gave way to an exceedingly efficient Japanese whose name was Tanalahaka, but who confessed that he heeded any summons which included the disyllable Tana. Tana was unusually small, even for a Japanese, and displayed a somewhat naive conception of himself as a man of the world. On the day of his arrival from R. Gugimoniki, Japanese Reliable Employment Agency, he called Anthony into his room to see the treasures of his trunk. These included a large collection of Japanese postcards, which he was all for explaining to his employer at once, individually and at great length. Among them were half a dozen of pornographic intent and plainly of American origin, though the makers had modestly omitted both their names and the form for mailing. He next brought out some of his own handiwork, a pair of American pants, which he had made himself, and two suits of solid silk underwear. He informed Anthony confidentially as to the purpose for which these latter were reserved. The next exhibit was a rather good copy of an etching of Abraham Lincoln, to whose face he had given an unmistakable Japanese cast. Last came a flute. He had made it himself, but it was broken. He was going to fix it soon. After these polite formalities, which Anthony conjectured must be native to Japan, Tana delivered a long harangue in splintered English on the relation of master and servant, from which Anthony gathered that he had worked on large estates, but had always quarreled with the other servants because they were not honest. They had a great time over the word honest, and in fact became rather irritated with each other, because Anthony persisted stubbornly that Tana was trying to say hornets, and even went to the extent of buzzing in the manner of a bee and flapping his arms to imitate wings. After three quarters of an hour, Anthony was released with the warm assurance that they would have other nice chats in which Tana would tell how we do in my country. Such was Tana's garrulous premiere in the gray house, and he fulfilled its promise. Though he was conscientious and honorable, he was unquestionably a terrific bore. He seemed unable to control his tongue, sometimes continuing from paragraph to paragraph with a look akin to pain in his small brown eyes. Sunday and Monday afternoons he read the comic section of the newspapers. One cartoon which contained a facetious Japanese butler diverted him enormously, though he claimed that the protagonist, who to Anthony appeared clearly oriental, had really an American face. The difficulty with the funny paper was that when, aided by Anthony, he had spelled out the last three pictures and assimilated their context with a concentration surely adequate for Kant's critique, he had entirely forgotten what the first pictures were about. In the middle of January, Anthony and Gloria celebrated their first anniversary by having a date. Anthony knocked at the door and she ran to let him in. Then they sat together on the couch, calling over those names they had made for each other, new combinations of endearments ages old. Yet to this date was appended no attenuated good night with its ecstasy of regret. Later in June, horror leered out at Gloria, struck at her, and frightened her bright soul back half a generation. Then slowly it faded out, faded back into that impenetrable darkness whence it had come, taking relentlessly its modicum of youth. With an infallible sense of the dramatic, it chose a little railroad station in a wretched village near Port Chester. The station platform lay all day bare as a prairie, exposed to the dusty yellow sun and to the glance of that most obnoxious type of countryman who lives near a metropolis and has attained its cheap smartness without its urbanity. A dozen of these yokels, red-eyed, cheerless as scarecrows, saw the incident. Dimly it passed across their confused and uncomprehending minds, taken at its broadest for a coarse joke, at its subtlest for a shame. Meanwhile, there upon the platform a measure of brightness faded from the world. With Eric Merriam, Anthony had been sitting over a decanter of scotch all the hot summer afternoon, while Gloria and Constance Merriam swam and sunned themselves at the beach club, the latter under a striped parasol awning. Gloria stretched sensuously upon the soft, hot sand, tanning her inevitable legs. Later they had all four played with inconsequential sandwiches. Then Gloria had risen tapping Anthony's knee with her parasol to get his attention. "'We've got to go, dear.' "'Now?' He looked at her unwillingly. 
at that moment nothing seemed of more importance than to idle on that shady porch drinking mellowed scotch while his host reminisced interminably on the by-play of some forgotten political campaign we've really got to go repeated gloria we can get a taxi to the station come on anthony she commanded a bit more imperiously now see here Merriam, his yarn cut off made conventional objections meanwhile provocatively filling his guest's glass with a highball that should have been sipped through ten minutes but at gloria's annoyed we really must anthony drank it off got to his feet and made an elaborate bow to his hostess it seems we must he said with little grace in a minute he was following gloria down the garden walk between tall rose bushes her parasol brushing gently the june blooming leaves most inconsiderate he thought as they reached the road he felt with injured naivete that gloria should not have interrupted such innocent and harmless enjoyment the whiskey had both soothed and clarified the restless things in his mind it occurred to him that she had taken this same attitude several times before was he always to retreat from pleasant episodes at a touch of her parasol or a flicker of her eye his unwillingness blurred to ill-will which rose within him like a resistless bubble he kept silent perversely inhibiting a desire to reproach her they found a taxi in front of the inn rode silently to the little station then anthony knew what he wanted to assert his will against this cool and impervious girl to obtain with one magnificent effort a mastery that seemed infinitely desirable let's go over to see the barneses he said without looking at her i don't feel like going home mrs barnes nay rachel gerald had a summer place several miles for redgate we went there the day before yesterday she answered shortly i'm sure they'd be glad to see us he felt that that was not a strong enough note braced himself stubbornly and added i want to see the barneses i haven't any desire to go home well i haven't any desire to go to the barneses suddenly they stared at each other why anthony she said with annoyance this is sunday night and they probably have guests for supper why should we go in at this hour then why couldn't we have stayed at the merriam's he burst out why go home when we were having a perfectly decent time they asked us to supper they had to give me the money and i'll get the railroad tickets i certainly will not i'm in no humor for a ride in that damn hot train gloria stamped her foot on the platform anthony you act as if you're tight on the contrary i'm perfectly sober but his voice had slipped into a husky key and she knew with certainty that this was untrue if you're sober you'll give me the money for the tickets but it was too late to talk to him that way in his mind was but one idea that gloria was being selfish that she was always being selfish and would continue to be unless here and now he asserted himself as her master this was the occasion of all occasions since for a whim she had deprived him of a pleasure his determination solidified approached momentarily a dull and sullen hate i won't go in the train he said his voice trembling a little with anger we're going to the barneses i'm not she cried if you go i'm going home alone go on then without a word she turned toward the ticket office simultaneously he remembered that she had some money with her and that this was not the sort of victory he wanted the sort he must have he took a step after her and seized her arm see here he muttered you're not going alone i certainly am why anthony this exclamation as she tried to pull away from him and he only tightened his grasp he looked at her with narrowed and malicious eyes let go her cry had a quality of fierceness if you have any decency you'll let go why he knew why but he took a confused and not quite confident pride in holding her there i'm going home do you understand and you're going to let me go no i'm not her eyes were burning now are you going to make a scene here i say you're not going i'm tired of your eternal selfishness i only want to go home two wrathful tears started from her eyes this time you're going to do what i say slowly her body straightened her head went back in a gesture of infinite scorn i hate you her low words were expelled like venom through her clenched teeth oh let me go oh i hate you 
she tried to jerk herself away but he only grasped the other arm i hate you i hate you at gloria's fury his uncertainty returned but he felt that now he had gone too far to give in it seemed that he had always given in and that in her heart she had despised him for it ah she might hate him now but afterward she would admire him for his dominance the approaching train gave out a premonitory siren that tumbled melodramatically toward them down the glistening blue tracks gloria tugged and strained to free herself and words older than the book of genesis came to her lips oh you brute she sobbed oh you brute oh i hate you oh you brute oh on the station platform other prospective passengers were beginning to turn and stare the drone of the train was audible it increased to a clamor gloria's efforts redoubled then ceased altogether and she stood there trembling and hot-eyed at this helpless humiliation as the engine roared and thundered into the station lo below the flood of steam and the grinding of the brakes came her voice oh if there was one man here you couldn't do this you couldn't do this you coward you coward oh you coward anthony silent trembling himself gripped her rigidly aware that faces dozens of them curiously unmoved shadows of a dream were regarding him then the bells distilled metallic crashes that were like physical pain the smokestacks volleyed in slow acceleration at the sky and in a moment of noise and gray gaseous turbulence the line of faces ran by moved off became indistinct until suddenly there was only the sun slanting east across the tracks and a volume of sound decreasing far off like a train made out of tin thunder he dropped her arms he had won now if he wished he might laugh the test was done and he had sustained his will with violence let leniency walk in the wake of victory we'll hire a car here and drive back to marietta he said with fine reserve for answer gloria seized his hand with both of hers and raising it to her mouth bit deeply into his thumb he scarcely noticed the pain seeing the blood spurt he absent-mindedly drew out his handkerchief and wrapped the wound that too was part of the triumph he supposed it was inevitable that defeat should thus be resented and as such was beneath notice she was sobbing almost without tears profoundly and bitterly i won't go i won't go you can't make me go you've you've killed any love i ever had for you and any respect but all that's left in me would die before i'd move from this place oh if i thought you'd lay your hands on me you're going with me he said brutally if i have to carry you he turned beckoned to a taxicab, told the driver to go to Marietta. The man dismounted and swung the door open. Anthony faced his wife and said between his clenched teeth, Will you get in, or will I put you in? With a subdued cry of infinite pain and despair, she yielded herself up and got into the car. All the long ride, through the increasing dark of twilight, she sat huddled in her side of the car, her silence broken by an occasional dry and solitary sob. Anthony stared out the window, his mind working dully on the slowly changing significance of what had occurred. Something was wrong. That last cry of Gloria's had struck a chord which echoed posthumously and with incongruous disquiet in his heart. He must be right. Yet she seemed such a pathetic little thing now, broken and dispirited, humiliated beyond the measure of her lot to bear. The sleeves of her dress were torn, her parasol was gone, forgotten on the platform. It was a new costume, he remembered, and she had been so proud of it that very morning when they had left the house. He began wondering if anyone they knew had seen the incident, and persistently there recurred to him her cry, All that's left in me would die. This gave him a confused and increasing worry. It fitted so well with the Gloria who lay in the corner, no longer a proud Gloria, nor any Gloria he had known. He asked himself if it were possible. While he did not believe she would cease to love him, this, of course, was unthinkable. It was yet problematical whether Gloria, without her arrogance, her independence, her virginal confidence and courage, would be the girl of his glory, the radiant woman who was precious and charming because she was ineffably, triumphantly herself. He was very drunk even then, so drunk as to not realize his own drunkenness. When they reached the gray house he went to his own room and, 
his mind still wrestling helplessly and somberly with what he had done, fell into a deep stupor on his bed. It was after one o'clock, and the hall seemed extraordinarily quiet when Gloria, wide-eyed and sleepless, traversed it and pushed open the door of his room. He had been too befuddled to open the windows, and the air was stale and thick with whiskey. She stood for a moment by his bed, a slender, exquisitely graceful creature in her boyish silk pajamas. Then, with abandon, she flung herself upon him, half waking him in the frantic emotion of her embrace, dropping her warm tears upon his throat. "'Oh, Anthony!' she cried passionately. "'Oh, my darling, you don't know what you did!' Yet in the morning, coming early into her room, he knelt down by her bed and cried like a little boy, as though it was his heart that had been broken. "'It seemed, last night,' she said gravely, her fingers playing in his hair, "'that all the part of me you loved, the part that was worth knowing, all the pride and fire, was gone. I knew that what was left of me would always love you, but never in quite the same way. Nevertheless, she was aware even then that she would forget in time, and that it is the manner of life seldom to strike, but always to wear away. After that morning the incident was never mentioned, and its deep wound healed with Anthony's hand, and if there was triumph, some darker force than theirs possessed it, possessed the knowledge and the victory. Nietzschean Incident Gloria's independence, like all sincere and profound qualities, had begun unconsciously, but, once brought to her attention by Anthony's fascinated discovery of it, it assumed more nearly the proportions of a formal code. From her conversation it might be assumed that all her energy and vitality went into a violent affirmation of the negative principle, never give a damn. Not for me or anybody, she said, except myself, and, by implication, for Anthony. That's the rule of all life, and if it weren't, I'd be that way anyhow. Nobody'd do anything for me if it didn't gratify them to, and I'd do as little for them. She was on the front porch of the nicest lady in Marietta when she said this, and as she finished she gave a curious little cry and sank in a dead faint to the porch floor. The lady brought her to and drove her home in her car. It had occurred to the estimable Gloria that she was probably with child. She lay upon the long lounge downstairs. Day was slipping warmly out the window, touching the late roses on the porch pillars. "'All I think of ever is that I love you,' she wailed. "'I value my body because you think it's beautiful. And this body of mine, of yours, to have it grow ugly and shapeless, it's simply intolerable. Oh, Anthony, I'm not afraid of the pain.' He consoled her desperately, but in vain. She continued. And then afterward I might have wide hips and be pale, with all my freshness gone and no radiance in my hair. He paced the floor with his hands in his pockets, asking, Is it certain? I don't know anything. I've always hated obstructs or whatever you call them. I thought I'd have a child sometime, but not now. Well, for God's sake, don't lie there and go to pieces. Her sobs lapsed. She drew down a merciful silence from the twilight which filled the room. Turn on the lights, she pleaded. These days seem so short. June seemed to have longer days when I was a little girl. The light snapped on, and it was as though blue drapes of softest silk had been dropped behind the windows and the door. Her pallor, her immobility, without grief now or joy, awoke his sympathy. Do you want me to have it? she asked listlessly. I'm indifferent. That is, I'm neutral. If you have it, I'll probably be glad. If you don't, well, that's all right, too. I wish you'd make up your mind one way or the other. Suppose you make up your mind. She looked at him contemptuously, scorning to answer. You'd think you'd been singled out of all the women in the world for this crowning indignity. What if I do? she cried angrily. It isn't an indignity for them. It's their one excuse for living. It's the one thing they're good for. It is an indignity for me. See here, Gloria, I'm with you whatever you do, but for God's sakes be a sport about it. Oh, don't fuss at me, she wailed. They exchanged a mute look of no particular significance, but of much stress. Then Anthony took a book from the shelf and dropped into a chair. Half an hour later her voice came out of the intense stillness that pervaded the room and hung like incense on the air. 
I'll drive over and see Constance Merriam tomorrow. All right, and I'll go to Tarrytown and see Grandpa. You see, she added, it isn't that I'm afraid of this or anything else. I'm being true to me, you know. I know, he agreed. The Practical Men Adam Patch, in a pious rage against the Germans, subsisted on the war news. Pin maps plastered his walls, atlases were piled deep on tables convenient to his hand, together with photographic histories of the World War, official explain-alls, and the personal impressions of war correspondents and of privates X, Y, and Z. Several times during Anthony's visit, his grandfather's secretary, Edward Shuttleworth, the one-time accomplished gin physician of Pat's place in Hoboken, now shod with righteous indignation, would appear with an extra. The old man attacked each paper with untiring fury, tearing out those columns which appeared to him of sufficient pregnancy for preservation, and thrusting them into one of his already bulging files. "'Well, what have you been doing?' he asked Anthony blandly. "'Nothing? Well, I thought so. I've been intending to drive over and see you all summer. I've been writing. Don't you remember the essay I sent you, the one I sold to the Florentine last winter?' Essay? You never sent me any essay. Oh, yes, I did. We talked about it. Adam Patch shook his head mildly. Oh, no, you never sent me any essay. You may have thought you sent it, but it never reached me. Why, you read it, Grandpa, insisted Anthony, somewhat exasperated. You read it and disagreed with it. The old man suddenly remembered, but this was made apparent only by a partial falling open of his mouth, displaying rows of gray gums. Eyeing Anthony with a green and ancient stare, he hesitated between confessing his error and covering it up. "'So you're writing,' he said quickly. "'Well, why don't you go over and write about these Germans? Write something real, something about what's going on, something people can read.' "'Anybody can't be a war correspondent,' objected Anthony. "'You have to have some newspaper willing to buy your stuff, and I can't spare the money to go over as a freelance.' I'll send you over, suggested his grandfather, surprisingly. I'll get you over as an authorized correspondent of any newspaper you pick out. Anthony recoiled from the idea. Almost simultaneously, he bounded toward it. I don't know. He would have to leave Gloria, whose whole life yearned toward him and enfolded him. Gloria was in trouble. Oh, the thing wasn't feasible. Yet he saw himself in cocky, leaning, as all war correspondents lean, upon a heavy stick, portfolio at shoulder, trying to look like an Englishman. "'I'd like to think it over,' he confessed. "'It's certainly very kind of you. I'll think it over, and I'll let you know.' Thinking it over absorbed him on the journey to New York. He had had one of those sudden flashes of illumination vouchsafed to all men who are dominated by a strong and beloved woman, which showed them a world of harder men, more fiercely trained and grappling with the abstractions of thought and war." In that world, the arms of Gloria would exist only as the hot embrace of a chance mistress, coolly sought and quickly forgotten. These unfamiliar phantoms were crowding closely about him when he boarded his train for Marietta, in the Grand Central Station. The car was crowded, he secured the last vacant seat, and it was only after several minutes that he gave even a casual glance to the man beside him. When he did, he saw a heavy lay of jaw and nose, a curved chin, and small puffed under eyes. In a moment he recognized Joseph Blockman. Simultaneously they both half rose, were half embarrassed, and exchanged what amounted to a half handshake. Then, as though to complete the matter, they both half laughed. Well, remarked Anthony without inspiration, I haven't seen you for a long time. Immediately he regretted his words and started to add, I didn't know you lived out this way. But Blockman anticipated him by asking pleasantly, How's your wife? She's very well. How have you been? Excellent. His tone amplified the grandeur of the word. It seemed to Anthony that during the last year Blockman had grown tremendously in dignity. The boiled look was gone. He seemed done at last. In addition, he was no longer overdressed. The inappropriate facetiousness he had affected in ties had given way to a sturdy dark pattern and his right hand, which had formerly displayed two heavy rings, was now innocent of ornament and even without the raw glow of a manicure. 
This dignity appeared also in his personality. The last aura of the successful traveling man had faded from him, that deliberate ingratiation of which the lowest form is the body joke in the Pullman smoker. One imagined that, having been fawned upon financially, he had attained aloofness, having been snubbed socially, he had acquired reticence. But whatever had given him weight instead of bulk, Anthony no longer felt a correct superiority in his presence. Do you remember Caramel, Richard Caramel? I believe you met him one night. I remember. He was writing a book. Well, he sold it to the movies. Then they had some scenario man named Jordan work on it. Well, Dick subscribes to a clipping bureau, and he's furious because about half of the movie reviewers speak of the power and strength of William Jordan's demon lover. Didn't mention old Dick at all. You'd think this fellow Jordan had actually conceived and developed the thing. Blockman nodded comprehensively. Most of the contracts state that the original writer's name goes into all the paid publicity. Is Caramel still writing? Oh, yes. Writing hard. Short stories. Well, that's fine, that's fine. You on this train often? About once a week. We live in Marietta. Is that so? Well, well. I live near Coscob myself. Bought a place there only recently. We're only five miles apart. You'll have to come and see us. Anthony was surprised at his own courtesy. I'm sure Gloria'd be delighted to see an old friend. Anybody'll tell you where the house is. It's our second season there. Thank you. Then, as though returning a complimentary politeness, how is your grandfather? He's been well. I had lunch with him today. A great character, said Blockman severely, a fine example of an American. The Triumph of Lethargy Anthony found his wife deep in the porch hammock, voluptuously engaged with a lemonade and a tomato sandwich, and carrying on an apparently cheery conversation with Tana upon one of Tana's complicated themes. In my country, Anthony recognized his invariable preface, all time peoples eat rice because haven't got, cannot eat would no have got. Had his nationality not been desperately apparent, one would have thought he had acquired his knowledge of his native land from American primary school geographies. When the Oriental had been squelched and dismissed to the kitchen, Anthony turned questioningly to Gloria. It's all right, she announced, smiling broadly, and it surprised me more than it does you. There's no doubt? None. Couldn't be. They rejoiced happily, gay again with reborn irresponsibility. Then he told her of his opportunity to go abroad, and that he was almost ashamed to reject it. What do you think? Just tell me frankly. Why, Anthony! Her eyes were startled. Do you want to go? Without me? His face fell, yet he knew, with his wife's question, that it was too late. Her arms, sweet and strangling, were around him, for he had made all such choices back in that room in the plaza the year before. This was an anachronism from an age of such dreams. Gloria! he lied in a great burst of comprehension. Of course I don't. I was thinking you might go as a nurse or something. He wondered dully if his grandfather would consider this. As she smiled, he realized again how beautiful she was, a gorgeous girl of miraculous freshness and sheerly honorable eyes. She embraced his suggestion with luxurious intensity, holding it aloft like a sun of her own making and basking in its beams. She strung together an amazing synopsis for an extravaganza of marital adventure. After supper, surfeited with the subject, she yawned. She wanted not to talk but only to read Penrod, stretched upon the lounge until at midnight she fell asleep. But Anthony, after he had carried her romantically up the stairs, stayed awake to brood upon the day, vaguely angry with her, vaguely dissatisfied. "'What am I going to do?' he began at breakfast. Here we've been married a year, and we've just worried around without even being efficient people of leisure. Yes, you ought to do something, she admitted, being in an agreeable and loquacious humor. This was not the first of these discussions, but as they usually developed Anthony in the role of protagonist, she had come to avoid them. It's not that I have any moral compunctions about work, he continued, but Grandpa may die tomorrow, or he may live for ten years. Meanwhile, we're living above our income, and all we've got to show for it is a farmer's car and a few clothes. We keep an apartment that we've only lived in three months, and a little old house way off in nowhere. 
we're frequently bored and yet we won't make any effort to know anyone except the same crowd who drift around california all summer wearing sports clothes and waiting for their families to die how you've changed remarked gloria once you told me you didn't see why an american couldn't loaf gracefully well damn it i wasn't married and the old mind was working at top speed and now it's going round and round like a cogwheel with nothing to catch it as a matter of fact i think that if i hadn't met you i would have done something but you make leisure so subtly attractive oh it's all my fault i didn't mean that and you know i didn't but here i'm almost twenty-seven and oh she interrupted in vexation you make me tired talking as though i were objecting or hindering you i was just discussing it gloria can't i discuss i should think you'd be strong enough to settle something with you without your own problems without coming to me you talk a lot about going to work i could use more money very easily but i'm not complaining whether you work or not i love you her last words were as gentle as fine snow upon hard ground but for the moment neither was attending to the other they were each engaged in polishing and perfecting his own attitude i have worked some this by anthony was an imprudent bringing up of raw reserves Gloria laughed, torn between delight and derision. She resented his sophistry, as at the same time she admired his nonchalance. She would never blame him for being the ineffectual idler, so long as he did it sincerely, from the attitude that nothing much was worth doing. Work, she scoffed. Oh, you sad bird, you bluffer. Work, that means a great arranging of the desk and the lights, a great sharpening of pencils, and Gloria, don't sing, and please keep that damned tana away from me, and let me read you my opening sentence, and I won't be through for a long time, Gloria, so don't stay up for me, and a tremendous consumption of tea or coffee, and that's all. In just about an hour I hear the old pencil stop scratching and look over. You've got out a book, and you're looking up something. Then you're reading. Then yawns, then bed, and a great tossing about because you're all full of caffeine and can't sleep. Two weeks later, the whole performance over again. With much difficulty, Anthony retained a scanty breech clout of dignity. Now, that's a slight exaggeration. You know darn well I sold an essay to the Florentine, and it attracted a lot of attention considering the circulation of the Florentine. And what's more, Gloria, you know I sat up till five o'clock in the morning finishing it. She lapsed into silence, giving him rope. And if he had not hanged himself, he had certainly come to the end of it. At least, he concluded feebly, I'm perfectly willing to be a war correspondent. But so was Gloria. They were both willing, anxious. They assured each other of it. The evening ended on a note of tremendous sentiment, the majesty of leisure, the ill health of Adam Patch, love at any cost. Anthony, she called over the banister one afternoon, a week later, there's someone at the door. Anthony, who had been lolling in the hammock on the sun-speckled south porch, strolled around to the front of the house. A foreign car, large and impressive, crouched like an immense and saturnine bug at the foot of the path. A man in a soft pongee suit with cap to match hailed him. "'Hello there, Patch. Ran over to call on you.' It was Blockwin, as always, infinitesimally improved, of subtler intonation, of more convincing ease. "'I'm awfully glad you did.' Anthony raised his voice to a vine-covered window. "'Gloria, we've got a visitor.' "'I'm in the tub,' wailed Gloria politely. With a smile, the two men acknowledged the triumph of her alibi. "'She'll be down. Come round here on the sideboard. Like a drink? Gloria's always in the tub, a good third of every day. Pity she doesn't live on the sound. Can't afford it.' As coming from Adam Patch's grandson, Blockman took this as a form of pleasantry. After fifteen minutes filled with estimable brilliancies, Gloria appeared, fresh and starched yellow, bringing atmosphere and an increase of vitality. "'I want to be a successful sensation in the movies,' she announced. "'I hear that Mary Pickford makes a million dollars annually.' "'You could, you know,' said Blockman. "'I think you'd film very well.' "'Would you let me, Anthony, if I only play unsophisticated roles?' As the conversation continued in stilted commas, Anthony wondered that to him and Blockman both this girl had once been the most stimulating, the most tonic personality they had ever known, and now the three sat like over-oiled machines, without conflict, 
without fear, without elation, heavily enameled little figures secure beyond enjoyment in a world where death and war, dull emotion and noble savagery were covering a continent with the smoke of terror. In a moment he would call Tana, and they would pour into themselves a gay and delicate poison which would restore them momentarily to the pleasurable excitement of childhood, when every face in a crowd had carried its suggestion of splendid and significant transactions taking place somewhere to some magnificent and illimitable purpose. Life was no more than the summer afternoon, a faint wind stirring the lace collar of Gloria's dress, the slow baking drowsiness of the veranda. Intolerably unmoved they all seemed, removed from any romantic imminency of action. Even Gloria's beauty needed wild emotions, needed poignancy, needed death. Any day next week, Bachman was saying to Gloria, here, take this card. What they do is give you a test of about three hundred feet of film, and they can tell pretty accurately from that. How about Wednesday? Wednesday's fine. Just phone me and I'll go around with you. He was on his feet, shaking hands briskly. Then his car was a wraith of dust down the road. Anthony turned to his wife in bewilderment. Why, Gloria! You don't mind if I have a trial, Anthony? Just a trial? I've got to go to town Wednesday anyhow. But it's so silly. You don't want to go into the movies, moon around a studio all day with a lot of cheap chorus people. A lot of mooning around Mary Pickford does. Everybody isn't a Mary Pickford. Well, I can't see how you'd object to my trying. I do, though. I hate actors. Oh, you make me tired. Do you imagine I have a very thrilling time dozing on this damn porch? You wouldn't mind if you loved me. Of course I love you, she said impatiently, making out a quick case for herself. It's just because I do that I hate to see you go to pieces by just lying around and saying you ought to work. Perhaps if I did go into this for a while, it'd stir you up so you'd do something. It's just your craving for excitement, that's all it is. Maybe it is. It's a perfectly natural craving, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you one thing. If you go to the movies, I'm going to Europe. Well, go on then. I'm not stopping you. To show she was not stopping him, she melted into melancholy tears. Together they marshaled the armies of sentiment, words, kisses, endearments, self-reproaches. They attained nothing. Inevitably, they attained nothing. Finally, in a burst of gargantuan emotion, each of them sat down and wrote a letter. Anthony's was to his grandfather, Gloria's was to Joseph Blockman. It was a triumph of lethargy. One day, early in July, Anthony, returned from an afternoon in New York, called upstairs to Gloria. Receiving no answer, he guessed she was asleep, and so went into the pantry for one of the little sandwiches that were always prepared for them. He found Tana seated at the kitchen table before a miscellaneous assortment of odds and ends, cigar boxes, knives, pencils, the tops of cans, and some scraps of paper covered with elaborate figures and diagrams. "'What the devil are you doing?' demanded Anthony curiously. Tana politely grinned. "'I show you!' he exclaimed enthusiastically. "'I tell—' "'You making a doghouse?' "'No, sir.' Tana grinned again. "'Make typewater. "'Typewriter?' "'Yes, sir. "'I think, oh, all time I think, lie in bed, think about typewater. "'So you thought you'd make one, eh?' "'Wait, I tell.' Anthony, munching a sandwich, leaned leisurely against the sink. Tana opened and closed his mouth several times, as though testing its capacity for action. Then, in a rush, he began, "'I been think typewriter has, oh, many, 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 many thing. Oh, many, 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 many—' "'Many keys? I see. No? Yes, key. Many, 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 many letter. Like so, A, B, C.' Yes, you're right. Wait, I tell. He screwed his face up in a tremendous effort to express himself. I been think many words and same, like I-N-G. You bet, a whole raft of them. So I make typewater quick, not so many letter. That's a great idea, Tana. Save time. You'll make a fortune. Press one key and there's ing. Hope you work it out. Tana laughed disparagingly. Wait, I tell... Where's Mrs. Patch? She out. Wait, I tell... Again he screwed up his face for action. My type water. Where is she? Here, I make. He pointed to the miscellany of junk on the table. I mean Mrs. Patch. 
She out, Tana reassured him. She be back five o'clock, she say. Down in the village? No, went off before lunch. She go, Mr. Blockman. Anthony started. Went out with Mr. Blockman? She be back five. Without a word, Anthony left the kitchen with Tana's disconsolate, I tell, trailing after him. So this was Gloria's idea of excitement by God. His fists were clenched. Within a moment he had worked himself up to a tremendous pitch of indignation. He went to the door and looked out. There was no car in sight, and his watch stood at four minutes of five. With furious energy he dashed down to the end of the path. As far as the bend of the road a mile off he could see no car, except— but it was a farmer's fliver. Then, in an undignified pursuit of dignity, he rushed back to the shelter of the house as quickly as he had rushed out. Pacing up and down the living room, he began an angry rehearsal of the speech he would make to her when she came in. So this is love, he would begin. Or, no, it sounded too much like the popular phrase, so this is Paris. He must be dignified, hurt, grieved, anyhow, so this is what you do when I have to go up and trot all day around the hot city on business. No wonder I can't write. No wonder I don't dare let you out of my sight. He was expanding now, warming to his subject. I'll tell you, he continued, I'll tell you. He paused, catching a familiar ring in the words. Then he realized it was Tana's, I tell. Yet Anthony neither laughed nor seemed absurd to himself. To his frantic imagination it was already six, seven, eight, and she was never coming. Blockman, finding her bored and unhappy, had persuaded her to go to California with him. There was a great to-do out in front, a joyous, Yoho, Anthony! And he rose, trembling, weakly happy to see her, fluttering up the path. Blockman was following, cap in hand. Dearest, she cried, we've just been for the best jaunt, all over New York State. I'll have to be starting home, said Blockman, almost immediately. Wish you'd both been here when I came. I'm sorry I wasn't, answered Anthony dryly. When he had departed, Anthony hesitated. The fear was gone from his heart, yet he felt that some protest was ethically apropos. Gloria resolved his uncertainty. I knew you wouldn't mind. He came just before lunch and said he had to go to Garrison on business, and wouldn't I go with him? He looks so lonesome, Anthony and I drove his car all the way. Listlessly, Anthony dropped into a chair, his mind tired, tired with nothing, tired with everything, with the world's weight he had never chosen to bear. He was ineffectual and vaguely helpless here, as he had always been. One of those personalities who, in spite of all their words, are inarticulate, he seemed to have inherited only the vast tradition of human failure, that and the sense of death. I suppose I don't care he answered. One must be broad about these things, and Gloria, being young, being beautiful, must have reasonable privileges. Yet it wearied him that he failed to understand. End of Book Two, Chapter Two, Part One of Three